everyone welcome to our devotion this tuesday morning I trust that you are well I trust that you're enjoying the stunning weather that we're having at the moment it's a little bit cold but uh, the days are absolutely magnificent or certainly up here on the high felt uh, it is just amazing so we are going to be continuing with the parables that we started looking at last time from luke chapter 5 parable of the patches parable of the wine and the wineskins and we uh, started looking at that we looked at the parameters the context yesterday uh, the problem that jesus was trying to address and then looked at the progression and kind of spelt out the two parables as jesus told them and today we just kind of draw some applications uh, draw some principles out of these and what is the point of jesus having told them and so jesus was really responding to the scribes and the pharisees and their religion which was really a religion of, of a whole lot of do's and don'ts obeying not only the letter of the law but hundreds of other rules and regulations that they had instituted to make sure that the law was kept for example moses commanded that they should fast once a year the pharisees had modified that and made it into fasting uh, twice a week Jesus rebuked them for their emphasis on keeping the law without really any change of heart. And of the Pharisees, Jesus said in Matthew 23 verse 4, They tie up heavy loads and put them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to, to move them. I think the message that Jesus brought was radical. It was, when you think about it, quite revolutionary. It was so contradictory to the traditional uh, uh, Judaistic religion of the day and the two were totally incompatible in other words the old and the and the new covenants so Romans 4 13 to 15 says it was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world but through the righteousness that comes by faith for, for if, if those who depended depend on the law are heirs then faith means nothing and the promise is worthless because the law brings wrath so what does paul mean by that he's not talking here about the law as a moral standard for living he's talking of obeying the law in order to get to heaven you can't have it both ways it's either one or the other you can't put new wine into an old wine skin they're incompatible you can't put a, a new patch on an old garment and so in Galatians 3.18, Paul says the same thing. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it, is no longer, it no longer depends on a promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. So again, Paul is saying you can't have it both ways. You can't be saved through the old as well as the new covenant. The old covenant was based on man's promise. All that you say we will do. The new covenant is based on God's promise. That is why the book of Hebrews calls it a better promise. The old covenant depends on humans, human conformance to the law. The new covenant depends on God's provision and our response to that provision through what Jesus did for us on the cross. And so the old covenant was a covenant of, of works. The new covenant is a covenant of grace. And that is the difference between the two of them. Please understand, though, as I've said so many times before, that doesn't mean that we, we don't walk in obedience to God's word. We, don't, we kind of ignore the Old Testament as if it was obsolete. Not at all. Remember, Jesus came to fulfill the law of God. Okay? And that is why he, he often says, you know, you've heard it being said, but I say unto you. In other words, you give new meaning to what was written in the Old Testament. So what Jesus is really saying in these two parables is that legalism and salvation by grace are, are incompatible. You can't mix them together. They don't go together. You can't synthesize them. They are two opposite and contradictory ways of coming to God. If you want to come to God through the law and disobeying the Ten Commandments and living you know, by the golden rule, then, as Jesus said, you've got to be perfect, as my heavenly Father is perfect. That's the only way to get to God. The only other way to get to God is to rely on what God has done, okay? And God has, has uh, sent His Son to die on a cross so that we can 
trust in what he did for us for salvation. And so in Hebrews 8 verse 6, we read these words. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with the first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. And this is the, the beautiful part. I'll put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I'll be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. By calling this covenant new, he has made the first one obsolete. And what is obsolete and outdated will soon disappear. What an incredible passage of scripture. So when Jesus came to the world, he did not come to kind of refine Judaism. He did not come to improve it. He came to take it away and replace it with, with a new. And let us not misunderstand these parables. Jesus did not come, as we said earlier, to throw out the old covenant, as some might proclaim. He made it very clear in the Sermon on the Mount that he has come to fulfill the law, not to replace it. And so we remember with those words, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So he doesn't come to set aside the law, but to strip away the pharisaical notion that obedience to the law brought salvation. The old covenant failed not because the law was faulty, but the fault was with the people. The people could not keep the promise. Their ability was insufficient to fulfill the law of the Lord. And in the new covenant, Christ is our righteousness, both in terms of our standing before God and in terms of our daily living. Only God's spirit within us can fulfill the law, as we read in in Romans 3, 1 to 4, and, or rather Romans 8, 1 to 4, and Galatians 5, 16 to 23. And so what is the, the application then of this parable for us today? In fact, both of these parables. The wineskin is the church. William Eason writes, and I quote, Today, many congregations are becoming irrelevant to a hurting, unchurched world and are unable to offer new wine to a new generation. Ministries that worked in the industrial age no longer meet the needs of people in an informational age. In an age of computers, we cannot express truth in the language of the chariot age. The time has come for new wineskins. We are living in a rapidly changing world. End quote. And I think that is so true. The wineskin is the church and God wants to pour new wine into, into his wineskin. We, we need to throw out outdated modes of ministry and practices. And we need to allow God to, to fill us with new wine. That his spirit wants to fill the church and do something new in and through the church today. And in many respects what is going on right now is is kind of new wine into a new wineskin. We are doing church so so differently now than we've ever done it before. And I'm not saying that this is ideal, but it certainly has opened up uh, new opportunities for sharing God's word and and uh, sharing the message of salvation. And so we give praise to God for for His church, and we praise God that His church is not a building; His church are the people. And as the wine is being poured into the people, wherever they are, 
Uh, I just pray that they too will go out and, and be able to spread that good news to, to all those they encounter. And so may God uh, just teach us through these parables the, the importance of change, that we must be open to change, that we must be, be, we be able to put new wineskin uh, or, or rather new wine into a new wineskin and not into kind of old, archaic, outdated methods. And so may, may the Lord uh, help us as we do that together. And so let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you for your word. We just thank you for these, these parables that are so insightful. They teach us the importance of change. And, and the religious leaders of Jesus' day just couldn't make that change. They, they wanted to conform to the law. They wanted to conform to a whole lot of do's and don'ts and regulations and rituals. As if those lifeless uh, uh, methods were, were ways of coming to you. And yet we know, Lord God, that you came with a new covenant, a covenant of grace, a, a covenant that was was fresh and, and, uh, and new and enabled us to... to uh, trust you for our salvation and not all the things that we could do for you. And so we just pray, Lord, that you would continue to, to make us uh, uh, creatures of change, Lord, uh, that we would not resist change. And when change happens, that we might embrace it and that we might be ready for that new wine that you want to pour into new wineskins. And so thank you for what you're doing around the world right now, even through technology and multimedia and so on, uh, to various platforms, we thank you for new opportunities that have arisen where your church is, is, is working, even though they're not meeting together uh, in one place. They are meeting uh, with you wherever they are, and, and somehow there's just something very rich and something very good about that. And so we, we pray, Lord, that you would just continue to, to guide us and and, and teach us your, your ways in these, in these days. And we ask all this in and through your precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, bless you all. Have a wonderful day. And we'll catch up with you. And hope we'll get back into one of the Psalms uh, uh, tomorrow. Bless you all.